Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Matt Crosman. I'm the uh, Faith Initiative Director here at the Grace Farms Foundation. So glad that you could join us uh, today. Um, as we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, first of all, um, this meeting uh, will be recorded um, so that we can uh, share it with those who aren't able to join us live. Um, we have muted everyone by default so that we won't be disrupted by latecomers, but um, we'll leave it up to you whether you want to have your camera on or off. Um, I would encourage you, please set your, your, uh, your Zoom to speaker view by clicking on the icon in the top right corner of your screen. That'll give you the best experience today. And then if you do have any technical difficulties, I encourage you to chat um, within the Zoom um, uh, interface itself. You can chat with the Grace Farms events. Um, you are welcome to use that chat box throughout the event. Uh, my colleagues and I will be monitoring your questions and we'll respond to as many as we can. Um, the format of our event will largely be an interview um, uh, between me and our, our guest today. Um, but if you do have questions, um, I encourage you to share those and I'll see if I can work those into the interview. Finally, um, as, as we interact today, uh, we just want to acknowledge there is so much going on in the world today. Um, and uh, we know we're all under uh, lots of different sorts of stressors. Um, uh, but we, we ask uh, that, uh, especially at a moment like this, we ask that uh, you to remain respectful of our entire audience as we uh, interact today. This series um, on uh, books on faith and meaning, um, the, this series is really oriented around the faith initiative's fundamental question. And that question is, what is the shape of flourishing life? How can um, various texts, um, various books help us make progress in our own quest to answer this question? Now, this series assumes that reading is not enough. Um, that's actually, I think, one of the things that we're going to want to talk about today with our guests. Um, but, but texts can give us access to people, to histories, to ideas that if we allow them to do their work on us can contribute substantially to our quest. And today, in particular, um, some of the questions we'll have on the table, one of them in particular might be this. How can we find meaning in our lives when we're regularly coming face to face with our fragility and the fragility of all that we hold dear? And the book that we've brought today, um, This Life, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom, suggests that this fragility isn't an obstacle to meaning in our lives, but rather a condition of its possibility. And so we are privileged to have the author of this book with us today. Um, Martin Hagland is a professor of comparative literature and humanities at Yale University. He's also a member of the Society of Fellows at Harvard. In 2018, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. And this book, um, This Life, was awarded the Rene Velik Prize for the best book in the field of American comparative, uh, best book in the field by the American Comparative Literature Association. Um, the Velik Prize is generally considered to be the most prestigious uh, award in comparative literature. Past winners include Umberto Eco and Edward Said. Um, I met um, uh, Professor Hagland um, through the Yale Humanist community. Um, uh, a community of, of non-religious folks um, in the New Haven uh, uh, area that were meeting together in order to pursue these very questions. Um, C.S. Lewis once uh, wrote that the one who takes some question little regarded by others to be of central importance uh, this person can be our friend. And uh, Martin has been a friend to me in just this way. I have found um, this book, this project, as he's been working on it, um, personally challenging to me, uh, sharpening my own thoughts. Um, he and I uh, uh, do not and will not in this conversation agree on everything. Hopefully that's part of the, uh, the fun of the conversation. Um, but we found it, I've, I've found um, uh, his, uh, his willingness, his, our shared question to be uh, a, a really valuable uh, ground for um, our, our conversation together. Um, Martin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Was that too soon? I appeared on screen. Uh, no, no, no. You you appeared in, and I got some sort of Zoom, um, some sort of technology error right at that moment, <laughs> and um, it, it threatened me that I might be thrown out of this call. So um, that that seems to be an idle threat. Anyway, I'm so glad that you're here with us. I'm so glad to be here, and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'm super delighted to, uh, for the first, but hopefully not the last time, uh, come and join this. Uh, this community. Um, 
the interactions we've had, the Yale Divinity School, the Yale Humanists, the Life Worth Living course has been great. And I'm really excited to, to visit today and, and pursue these questions in this context, which seems to me, I hope also post COVID that I, I will be able to visit this place, which I hear is extraordinary in, in real life. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm delighted to be here on Zoom. Yes, we need to have you um, on, on site for sure. And I'm, if I'm right, you're, you're joining us from Sweden, is that right? That is correct, yes. So, I mean, these are, there are some upsides to the weird world of COVID. You, the fact of your travel um, doesn't make it impossible for you to, to join us. So um, uh, I just, I just want to dive, dive right in. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the sort of key categories um, that you, distinctions that you draw for us in the book is this distinction between religious faith and secular faith. Now, to some folks, secular faith would just sound like a contradiction in terms. Um, but, you, but you propose that actually um, uh, all of us, even, even religious folks, it's not that religious faith, faith is the sort of faith that religious people have and secular faith is the sort of faith that secular people have, but you actually think that all of us, whether we're religious or not, and I know various ones of us on this call um, would identify differently in that respect, um, all of us actually engage in secular faith at the very least in certain ways. So could you just lay out those two categories for us? Absolutely. Great. That's a great opening. Thank you, Matt. Well, so the first thing to say, let me define, first of all, the first, because both of those terms, secular and faith, people can have a lot of different associations to those terms. Let me first be very clear what I mean by secular, uh, which is not restricted. I mean, in many modern discussions, we think about the separation of the church and the state and questions like that. Whereas for me, secular should be understood in terms of its Latin etymological root, where it's linked to the temporal, the historical, the worldly, more or less the way St. Augustine used the term uh, secularis as designating all those things which depend for their existence on historical, temporal, social practices. All of those things are secular. So as Augustine reminded us, we all live in a secular world in that sense, because we all live in historical, socially shared, temporal world, right? So that's the notion of the secular we're talking about here. And the reason I'm pairing that with faith is that, uh, faith here meaning not um, really being linked to any form of practical commitment that we have. I mean, if you think about it, people often are so surprised first when I talk about faith and they're like, as if that's an exclusively religious category, but we only have to think about everyday language. The way we talk about being faithful, keeping faith with something, uh, being unfaithful, you know, these, stake, these, these questions of fidelity and betrayal are at stake in all aspects of our lives. You know, it's sort of built into that. Uh, and that has to do with that, you know, when we're committed to something, or as we also say, when we believe in something, when we're devoted to something, we can't just be committed. We have to keep faith with that we're, with, with that with, with, with that to which we are committed, apologies, I've been speaking Swedish a lot recently, so my English might be nice. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, and built into that is that like, uh, we can lose faith, we can be unfaithful, we can betray that to which we're committed. So those, you know, the stakes of that. So really, that's also why, as you helped to recall, I argue that uh, on the most fundamental level, uh, everyone practices secular faith because, you know, whatever you believe in, like the, uh, you know, the, the society you're, you're trying to contribute to and be a part of, uh, you know, the, the vocation to which you're committed, all of those things don't just exist independently of us believing in them and keeping faith with them. They only exist through the way we uphold them through our practices socially. Like, I mean, like, the very community that I'm visiting today, it's not like that just exists there. The physical space might just be there even if we all drop dead, but the community that you care about only lives through the practice of us coming together, talking, having these conversations, holding each other accountable, all of those things. And that's a practice of secular faith in my sense, because the object of faith does not exist independently of the practice. You know, you can't like even, um, um, it, it, it essentially depends on us sustaining it. And that's a social material, social historical temporal practice, hence secular. So that's the idea. We can talk more about that, but just to lay out why that's, you know, the form uh, of all commitments 
the form of all practices has a sort of dynamic of secular faith because it's something that like we have to uphold on pain of the risk of losing it or or betraying it if we if we fail to uphold it or allow it to be perverted or distorted and so on yeah you want, this looks like you want to interrupt me there because I go on and on here. Yeah. No, no, no. This is no. This is this is great. Um, but then, and you were just starting to you were just starting to yeah. sort of um, run into this. But um, yeah. you you then argue that actually um, religious faith can end up being a sort of threat to the secular faith that actually grounds our lives and makes makes them meaningful. I wonder if you want to describe that sort of um, right. what you think right. religious faith to be and how it becomes potentially a threat to this um, existential secular faith. Right, right, right. A absolutely. And I want to be careful here. And this is one of the sort of hopes I have and why I'm excited to be, to be coming to this community today. I just want to be careful exactly about how this argument is laid out. Because um, first of all, in light of that, we can say, you know, I also want to show that a lot of things we think depend on religious faith actually in practice can be better understood as secular. Lots of the ways in which historically and in our contemporary times, religious communities, churches, other things have created and maintained important social communities committed to social causes and that, but you know, uh, but what I, what I call religious faith um, uh, is the idea that ultimately the, the ultimate object of faith or the highest good is something that uh, exists independently of our practical devotion to it, you know, uh, and that, so that's one part of it. And the other part of it has to do with that, the sense that even though in this life, uh, on this earth, uh, we are subject to those secular conditions of time and history and fragility and mortality, the highest good, the best state of things would be to ultimately be released, to be released from that, you know, so the ultimate end is to be released from having to practice faith in the secular sense and just say, be in the presence of God or repose in nirvana, uh, stoic apathy. I mean, there are many versions of it. So that's the first step, but we can disentangle all of this. Yeah, yeah. so uh, as I said, sort of in some of my framing, that actually yeah. makes a really interesting proposal, especially in this moment when so many of us are wrestling with this like really direct right. sort of encounter with our own fragility and the fragility of so many people and yeah. institutions um, and whatever else it might be that we really care about. Um, but you, you sort of turn it on its head that the, the, the potential of loss then yeah. isn't a threat to our care. It's yeah. actually part of what it means to care. I wonder if you could just yeah. tell, tell us a, a bit about that. It's a bit counterintuitive. Absolutely great. So like, and that is linked to this key concept for, for all of you here of, of flourishing, you know, and we'll come to that too. But and so the sense, the idea is that like, even what it is to be uh, alive and what distinguishes living beings, you know, is that you have to maintain yourself, that you, that, that, uh, you have to sustain yourself. And that's again, a sort of practice. And that like, if what you cared about could not be lost, could not be betrayed, could not be violated, was not fragile, it would not call out for your care. You know, it would be, be possible to understand in practice why it's important that you care for it uh, and what's at stake in that care. So I'm not, of, of course, denying that that fragility and mortality is also difficult and painful to bear, but I want to show that like, it is at the same time irreducibly what animates us and what makes our actions matter and what and what sort of like from within uh, puts our lives and our actions at stake so instead of trying to think of the highest good as something that would relieve us from that fragility it's rather about like actualizing a form of life that would allow us to deepen that care and flourish in our mortality and fragility in better ways yeah so then how should we relate to this prospect of loss? Because you're sort of carving out an interesting space between, yeah. um, you, you, say, you say we shouldn't try to secure ourselves against it, which right. you say many sort of what you call religious faith tries to do by saying, well, I'm, I'm secure against loss because I can lose something in this life. Um, you engage with C.S. Lewis on this. Yeah, on this. Yeah, yeah. But maybe I can, I can have, I can, I, can, I can say that what really matters to me most is is, is something that's promised to me in the in the ever after 
Yeah. So you want to, you don't say we shouldn't do that, but you also say we shouldn't try to, we shouldn't just give ourselves over to it either, because that yeah. would mean that we no longer are really relating to it as lost. That would be another way of sort of uh, yeah. giving up on care. Yes, exactly. You're trying to sort of like thread, thread a space, like how, and I think yes. this is really practical for a lot of us in our, in yeah, our lives. Absolutely. Right now. How should we relate to sort of the, the fragility of life, the threat? That we, yeah. the threats that we face to the things and the people that we care about most in the world. Great, yeah, that, that's, that's wonderful. So let me first, um, because highlight one thing in what you said, which is very important to the book. And again, it's on the sort of level of definition, but it's important because people have very different understandings of these terms. So what I'm calling various forms of religious ideals, their common denominator is the idea that the highest good would be to be absolved from pain and loss, anxiety, fragility. And, that, and that's why it can take the form of an idea of something like, you know, an eternal ever after or nirvana, but it can also have this sort of stoic ideal of just like giving up on the care and passions in this life that makes me vulnerable and the idea that the best state would be a sort of tranquility uh, imminently. So it can be an imminent ideal of being absolved from pain and loss or a transcendent one. But in both cases, it denies, loses sight of, this constitutive condition that actually like uh, you, you can't have the sense of the preciousness of the good without the threat of the bad you know you can't have flourishing without the possibility of withering you know you can't have well-being without the threat of pain and these things go together and we have to learn to live with that co-implication yeah mm. so and we can come to the sort of more I, I absolutely agree with you that the practical question is important but i also just want to see like often so many theoretical assumptions about you know um, what we're striving for sort of informed by question in advance i want to clear that first yeah yeah well that, that, that that's good and it, it's it strikes me as i as i read that you're you're really encouraging us to um to stare the possibility of loss in the face and i think forgive forgive me this may not be a word that you use but almost sort of we have to sort of like rage against that that reality, even as we know that it, know in some ways it's inevitability, yeah. and it's in that sort of struggle. So this isn't we're not aiming at a state that we're trying to get to. It's a, it's yeah. always a process of this yeah. sort of resistance of what we know is inevitable, which is the loss of what we care about so profoundly. Is that? Yes, absolutely. That's that's very helpful. You can also spin it sort of the positive way saying that like our commitment to flourishing you know and for that which we love to flourish uh, and that because that's the positive animating direction does not aim at, at, at a final state but because flourishing is an activity the old aristotelian insight you know that like flourishing is an activity and not at least as um, church going people know it's a social activity it's you know it's it's something you come together and do and that can't come to an end once the end would be death you know so we're not aiming at an end a state for it to to for the activities to cease we, we're seeking to maintain the activity deepen it making it flourish in the best possible way that's the sort of animating movement but then the point is just that like unless that animation was haunted from within by the sense that like we could wither, you know, we, the activity could cease, this could fall apart, this could turn bad. Yeah, yeah, you know, we couldn't have a sense of the good and the flourishing. But it's important that it's not good because it's going to be lost, because then everything would be good, because everything's going to be lost. It's rather that, like, within the sense, because what we're committed to is the flourishing, the, the, the notion of the good. It's just that the good is not this, uh, even its highest form, it's not this something exempt from the risk of loss it's like built into the goodness of the good is that risk yeah so the the greeks even like so for like plato yeah. the good would be better would the good would be better if it were eternally secured but yeah. for you you argue quite to the contrary it would yeah. it would lose some of its goodness if it were it wouldn't be secure. actually because yeah and here and in work i'm doing now which uh, on sort of the notion of the soul and the good explicitly flourishing, you know, I'm really trying to radicalize what's this Aristotelian insight. I mean, the highest good is an activity, being is an activity. And as soon as you see that, then you can start showing that that activity, 
must run the risk of falling apart for it to sort of like be a self-maintaining activity. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, yeah. now we've yeah. perhaps gotten to the, to, to the place where you can start introducing theological yeah. questions. And yeah. let me yeah, just say absolutely. to our, our audience, you know, Grace Farms, we're, the, the faith initiative isn't in, invested in any particular faith tradition. And in fact, we understand our question to be, uh, just as I hope we are already experiencing this conversation, yeah. our question yeah. is one that's relevant to both religious folks and, and folks that wouldn't identify as religious. Um, but I want to bring in the sort of the religious, some of the religious sort of claims or the theological claims that you, that you make in this book, because I think yeah. they're really interesting. Often yeah. when I introduce your project to people, I'll start with this sort of provocative framing, which I think comes directly from you. You, you, you yeah. say at some point, you know, um, most honest theologians will tell you that they cannot prove that God does exist. Um, yeah. they, think, they think, however, that they can make a case that you should hope that God does exist and, and invite you to, to inhabit a world in which God does exist. You say, I, I, similarly, I cannot convince you that God does not exist, um, but I think I can convince you that you should hope for your own sake that God does not exist. Um, and, I, and I take it that, that, that at least one of the key reasons there is that if God does exist, at least as many have imagined God, and that's where we'll have some, some conversation yeah. with fun, yeah. um, but at least as, as many have imagined God, um, yeah. God might secure, God might be precisely that sort of eternally secured good that actually sort of sucks all of the, all of the meaning out of life because it suddenly becomes impossible to care in the sort of dynamic way that you're talking about. I wonder if you just share, share a bit about, um, yeah, what is it that, about particular ways, at least, of thinking about God that would, um, that would really um, make it hard for us to be invested in flourishing in ways that we uh, ought to be? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm also excited to have this conversation now because in some of my current work, I think I'm moving further also towards this sort of like secular notion of the divine and God and so on. So it'd be very interesting to talk about that. But, you know, if we conceive of God and the divine, as uh, some sort of, of uh, eternal being or eternal repose or like what I'm trying to show there is that uh, you know uh, such a god uh, precisely could not care because to care you have to be susceptible to loss and so on as we talked about similarly if we attain such an eternal state like our lives would be over i mean this is sort of these notions of the eternal sabbath or the cosmic sabbath or nirvana all those are notions that it's not accidental that they describe a sort of state where like you can just be and don't, you don't have to do anything uh, but that's you know that's sort of conceptually inseparable from death and I want to like really push on that, you know, not just because we can't understand it, because like, no, that's the wrong way of thinking about the good. That's why you can't separate it from death and nothing, because it's not the right way of thinking about being and the good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then I think we can come to this a little later today, that in light of that, one can also start making sense of how we talk about God in a way that actually is about our life together and that has to do with the reading of Hegel that I know you want to talk about yeah. but we'll get there later but for now we can just say like insofar as because I want to I want to be clear on this too like it you know God and the divine can mean very many different things but insofar as there's any variation on the idea that like the highest good is either an eternal being or an eternal state of being or an eternal sabbath or nirvana and so on then that's the sort of idea that I'm criticizing. Instead of seeing that as the highest good, we should see the divine or the highest good, not as above or beyond us, but as between us, you know, in the social practices that we sustain. That's, in a way, the secularization of the divine that I'm trying to pursue when I'm trying to show the resource within religious traditions. So, like, where is the love? Like, not vertically, but here. Where is the responsibility? Not here, but here. Uh, and, and I want to show, like, in a way, you know, that's what many religious people already know in practice, but I sort of want to raise that to self-consciousness and give resources to affirm that, that that's where the divine is in our idea of the good as the social conception of the good that we're committed to, to sustaining and hold ourselves to. That's where it is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it actually uh, maybe ironically reminds me of a, of a saying of Jesus um, in which he said, um, the kingdom of God you will not say here it is or there it is rather the yeah. kingdom of god the rule of god the highest good god yeah. and creation at home with yeah. one another is among you um right. and i and i 
you and I have talked about this before, but I, yeah. I found myself again um, thinking as I was reading, um, what about this Christian idea of kenosis, which you, which you take yeah. up, yeah. Um, which is this, this idea that God has, God has God's self invested. Yeah. God's self, forgive me for the yeah. Yeah. theological yeah. language. I try not to use gendered language for God. Yeah. Yeah. God has invested God's self in the temporal, spatial unfolding of the world right. in ways that subject God to the possibility of loss, yeah. in ways that subject, um, I mean, I, I, it made me think about the theology of someone like um, Moltmann, who um, would be another sort of Hegelian, right. sort of inflected, but, but, but Moltmann saw no sort of conflict with um, Oh, we'll get to Hegel in a second. But yeah. but for Moltmann, this was this was not a sort of um, high-minded sort of um, you know uh, religion beyond revelation. This is in fact the substance of the revelation. Um, right. Moltmann thought because the substance of the revelation is perhaps encapsulated in something like we get in John one, right? That the yeah. that the that the word of God has has tabernacled among us. That this is in right. fact um, even more than just tabernacle. That that emphasizes the sort of um, the the, tempor the the fact that this is temporary, right? But the whole of, of of the story is about God making God's making a that yeah the of the of the world becoming a home, um, becoming the home of God, and the world finding its home in being at home with God. And this this really tight sort of connection between um, yeah. the 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 world and God. Are yeah. are there possibilities there for sort of finding some sort of common ground between this sort of second? Yeah this Christian project? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm so glad you bring this up because this is like where, I mean, towards the end of the book, I go there explicitly, but then in the base of the book, they have become the most productive when you route it for this thing. So I hope we can explore some of those things uh, yeah. today. So, and, you know, and already what you said about kenosis, and I'm sure lots of people know this here, like uh, in Luther's translation of the Bible, you know, when he uses the term entäußerung in German, it's precisely like he wants to convey this thought that like God out of love empties himself out in the world. That's, what, uh, that's the emptying out in the world, that's the incarnation. And the question is just like uh, how we should understand this, how we should read this and what it says about us and our notion of the divine. And on the sort of Hegelian understanding of religion that I'm trying to develop, granting that one can understand Hegel in many different ways. So it's, I'm just going to explain what I mean by the Hegel understanding. Uh, is that then like, you know, the divine has always actually been a name for the sort of social form of social life to which we are committed, the norms to which we hold one another. And, the way, and we're through the notion of the divine, we're trying to make sense of our obligations to one another, our relation to the world and so on. And that's why like maybe in, a prim in an early stage, like God is the sun because we seem to be completely dependent on the sun for our lives. And then we, and the Christianity plays an important part there because Hegel sees that it's like, it's the last step before like a full philosophical understanding of ourselves because, uh, you know, precisely because of this notion of incarnation that like through the incarnation and death of Jesus, like the sense of like the divine actually to be, to be divine and to be something that is capable of love and worthy of being loved must become mortal. And then the crucial difference between what I would call the religious and the secular interpretation is that on the secular inter on the religious interpretation, however varied, at the end of the day, the mortality of the divine has to be a transitional stage such that like God descends into the mortal to redeem us from it and then ascends from it, you know? Whereas the secular point I want to push with Hegel is that like, uh, no, what, what, it, what this really tells us representationally is that uh, even the highest good, the mortal must be something that lives and dies through our historical existence, that only lives on or is resurrected because we remember it, hold ourselves to it, but that is inseparable from, uh, uh, from, from that practice and thereby like allowing us to see that like the divine or God is really a name for the sort of what our, our notion of our social notion of the good, what is worth doing, what is worthy of our devotion, and thereby like the divine can be repressive or liberating depending on those norms, but 
the full secular self-consciousness is that like, that's what it's about. Uh, and the more we recognize that, the more we can take full responsibility for that. Uh, and that would be like, not an external critique of religion, but like fulfilling its sort of social mission from within. But that yeah. goes very fast. I'm happy to. No, oh, no. Um, no, it's, yeah. it's, it's helpful. I, I think when we, uh, we talked with uh, my uh, undergraduates this past spring, I think yeah. I, I, proposed that, I proposed to them that they might understand part of what you're doing is um, you, you're, you're sort of, um, you're suggesting that, that Jesus is calling them to, uh, <laughs> to sort of leave behind um, their, their religious faith in a certain sense, right? It, it, right. You, just because of what you said, just to highlight what you said, that, that your, the way you see it is there's actually, you're not, you're not trying to sort of critique religion as you are trying to aff affirm, it's an imminent critique, it's a critique yeah. from the inside, sort of affirm the, the good, the goals of the religious move, and here in this case, yeah. a, a specifically Christian sort of insight yeah. about the unity, about the, the way that the good is fundamentally incarnated, is fundamentally yeah. sort of um, entangled in, yeah. in the flow of history. Um, you think that you can deliver better on those goods than some of those, uh, than the sort of traditional theological um, uh, ways of describing uh, life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, All right. Well, oh, wait, no, maybe you had a question about that, or I just want to... No, no, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say on that note, because recently I'm, I'm just now finishing this response essay to, to sort of the debates around the argument about religion in the book. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about recently directly related to this. So Brandon Terry, who's a Martin Luther King scholar at Harvard, wrote a very beautiful essay on, on, on my book and where he comes along a long way in this sort of secular understanding of religious language. But then he, he asked this question about like, well, one thing that was really important to King and other civil rights people was the sense that like, even when you're like really deserted, like God is with you, you know? And he's like, so what does, what can you do with that? You know, okay, I can buy this that we don't need the eternity, that, but that sounds so that there's not, even in your darkest hour, you are not deserted, you know? God is with you. And, and I felt very interpolated by that. I thought it was a very good way of zoning in on an important issue. So one thing I'm trying to do in the response, and this is in line with the book, is that like, uh, the imminent critique of that is to like, uh, you know, uh, affirm the, normative commitment because one of the things we're saying to ourselves when we're saying that we're holding that as an ideal is that like uh, committing ourselves to a form of life or society where like even when you fall down and crash down like you know there's actually something you can rely on and that keeps you up but that's the promise of a sort of form of social life that we would sustain and that would actually be embodied in our institutions and practices what I'm calling democratic socialism, where that, where that sort of trust could actually be grounded in our social relations. And it wouldn't be dependent on my psychological faith that there is some supernatural entity who cares for me. What we're really longing for in that is a form of life where like, you know, there are good reasons to trust that uh, just through the way we actually sustain our lives embodied historically, socially. Yeah. 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 Any case. Yeah, no, this is, this is, uh, sorry, I'm just seeing multiple yeah. paths for, for us from yeah, here, yeah, uh, but uh, looking at the time, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep yeah. moving this forward. Yeah. Um, I think, um, so as you said, so we, you, you, you propose Martin Luther King as a sort of um, a, a Hegelian, uh, you, you talk about the influence of Hegel um, yeah. on, on King, especially in his time at Boston University. Yeah. Um, and indeed, there are lots of sort of readings of, of, of Hegel going on there in the sort of theological world um, at that time. Um, and you propose that King is, um, well, I, I, I came away worried with a worry, right? That, yeah. that, right. that what you're proposing is, I, I think something that you, you're very worried, I think, as, you, as we all ought to be about sort of how King has been received um, in modern in, in contemporary American uh, society, especially and by white folk for whom King is, you know, the, the reconciler and the sort of the safe black radical or maybe not, or maybe not even a radical anymore um, has been totally domesticated. And you, and you talk, you talk about that. Um, but I wonder if there's another sort of like misunderstanding that I, I, I was worried about in reading your description of King where you, we get a sense that like the real king is to be found in his political speeches right. and um, something other than 
something yeah something somehow something less than the authentic martin luther king is is to be found in in his preaching yeah um can you defend that sort of i mean that, that I, I worry that this is the sort of uh yeah again yeah. as i think about the sort of legacy of of, of this man and his work yeah yeah no it's a great question and and um so i'll I'll try to uh, sort of lay out how I pursue that argument, but I, you know, I, I take your concern very seriously and it's not meant to open up conversation rather than close it down. Uh, because one of the, so this is in a way, I mean, King plays a lot of important roles in the book, but just for the purpose of the conversation uh, here, like I try to also use that as a way of showing in practice what the sort of stakes and moves of an imminent critique of religion is, you know, and as we talked about before, uh, one of the ways of doing that is showing that like, well, one strand of religious thought and practice, or what we call religious thought and practice, there are a lot of resources there to recognize that like what we really mean by God is really like our social norms or like our ideal of fulfilling social justice in this world. And we can read it in a sort of secular way that way. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to show is like, the sort of actual function of the appeal to God or the promised land in his political speeches. But then there's a different strand where like, uh, and not just in King, but in religious traditions in general, where like God is, you know, the, emphatically then the name, not for like the form of our social historical life that we want to fulfill and, 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 and make real in this life, but rather like the name for like, the eternal savior that's going to save us from our finitude and so on and that's the sort of language that comes up in, in religious in, in, in king's religious sermons so i so i wanted to make a distinction between those two and then say like even though these could like you know coexist in king in various ways and you know i'm not passing judgment on that but that like when we think about how we want to historically inherit him we can see like in this line that I'm drawing for the political speeches, we can both understand his activism and we can also like have a secular understanding and affirmation of this religious language and the purpose it serves that doesn't, you know, hinge on the, the, the supernatural or the eternal or anything like that. So, but I'm very happy to hear more about your concerns about that move because it's Yeah, important. well, I mean, I, I mean, in, in part, I wonder whether the distinction even between sort of political speeches and religious speeches is itself one almost impossible to draw. So I would just right. sort of, just uh we can get into we can get into literary questions about sort of like yeah, yeah. is that a, is that a genre difference that we can even oh i see even well, deal I, with, right I guess um, I, and, yeah, yeah but i wonder whether that points to a more sort of integrated sense um uh in in terms of how um i mean we've found here at the foundation that especially yeah. if we work with our artists i have extraordinary mm -hmm. colleagues in the arts initiative here we work with world-class artists wrestling with fundamental um, contemporary issues and they find especially when it comes to issues around around race but any num any number of other of other issues yeah. as well there's usually in all interwoven um, uh, theological categories are sort of necessary um, and helpful and I, I feel in part what you're and this is complex in relationship to your yeah. work this concern yeah. because in part I see what you're doing is very yeah. in certain ways similar to what our many of our artists will do which is take up theological language take up theological questions because the questions yeah. are precisely the it's only in the theological register that you can really get to what's at stake um, right. in in some of the challenges that we're facing as we ask the question about the shape of flourishing life as we ask what sort of Absolutely. form of life would, would allow us to flourish at the same time, um, I, I think there's also a sense in which um, that move is is to try to is try to say um, is to try to point to an orientation beyond our own best ideals, um, and to try to and try to you know a, a concern I have is that yeah. even our best ideals we seem to be able to to use and abuse them <laughs> to no end, right? How many, you know, insert diatribe about how many wars yeah. fought in the name of peace, yeah. how many people yeah. enslaved in the name of freedom, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of our best ideals seem to be subject to this sort of abuse. Yeah. And this sort of theological move, I think it often is, is I think it's much more than mere rhetoric, is to say there is some sort of ideal that does sort of stand beyond and, and can sort of norm itself. 
um, that uh, uh, in, in certain times uh, I would describe, I think that's who God is for me. I think that's who Jesus right. is as, as, as living Christ. Right. This is love that can defend itself from my abuse of, of its name, right? right? Um, right. Love right. that can actually sort of defend itself from my abuse of its, of its name. Um, right. Yeah, I, the, hey, I, that, yeah, when, yeah. No, no, that's, that's great. I, that's 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 really um, helpful and illuminating. So I'm going to try to do try to do justice to to, to, yeah. to what you just said or respond to it from what, how I see that. But I, I, I found that to be a very sort of a, a clear and helpful statement of, of the issue. So, but just to back up for a moment. So, um, 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 yeah, the question is really like well, on the on the sort of sermons for political speeches. I, I wasn't really doing a general stronger difference. I would, what I was interested in with King is just that like in his case, there's a, I'm trying to show there's a big difference how he talks about God in those two different occasions, but that doesn't have to translate and that's how it has to be. You, even within sermons and religious speeches, that in many thinkers, you could read the sort of secular thing that I'm interested in. The key question is just for me really, uh, what we mean by God and whether we think that and the divine and whether we think it requires mortality or fragility or is ultimately exempt from it. That's the issue I always want to come back to, you know? So one thing I've said recently is that like, you know, no, my point is not that God is dead, but that God is mortal, you know, that's very different, you know, and that like, that, that I think that can be a helpful way for these sorts of framings, you know, like, uh, uh, because th th that's also signals that, you know, and that's why I agree with you that theological categories are super helpful for bringing into focus these deepest questions about the flourishing life. And that's why I want to engage with those categories and open up them up in a different way by trying to show that like, uh, when we, the, the, the best way of understanding what those notions are and why we need them in our lives have to do with like, uh, yeah, again, the norms to which we hold ourselves and that they must, and that the divine cannot be uh, independently of our historical existence. And that's why everything is at stake in our institutional practices. That's the full thought of the incarnation for me, you know? So I agree with you. Yes, the divine and God can be abused in all sorts of ways. But that's, that's for me, that's a way of highlighting why, like, everything is at stake in our institutional practices. Wow. Why, and, and, you know, what we have to own up to is precisely that uh, even then, um, because I can sort of like go along with half of what you said. And I think there is like when we hold up what we take to be the good, it's precisely supposed to be something that like to which we have to hold ourselves and exercise an authority over us. But that's in a way like an authority that we hold over ourselves and for which we are responsible. And the moment we start to think that like we can, uh, 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 I think there's far from securing one from abuse of that category by saying it's beyond abuse because that's something that you're doing and that you are saying now that this category I'm holding up as exempt, then the sort of internal self-criticism and responsibility for the norm runs the risk of being obfuscated or disowned, as I say in the book. So for me, it's like, uh, yeah, it, it is. I mean, there are all sorts of painful and difficult things in recognizing that like, wow, this is really our use and abuse, but that's also the chance of them like seeing why like the divine, the holy, the highest good is the way we relate to one another, the way we sustain our institutions and practices for better and for worse. And, and for me, that's the secular completion of the thought of the incarnation of the divine, so. I feel like I'm going on for too long in every question. But no, yeah. this is this is great. This is this is helpful. Um, and um, as much as I'm enjoying our conversation, I'll yeah. also say to our our, our guests, our, our other our other folks on this call, if you do have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. And um, I, I have plenty to take us through the end of our hour. But if you do have a question, make sure you go ahead and get it in. Um, let me let me take us to. Um, I have at least two other things that I'd love to talk about. Yeah. One is what you call the the revaluation of value. We haven't yeah. talked a whole lot about the political yeah. project in this book, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I don't know that we'll be able to get into get yeah. into it in its entirety. But I wondered if we at least talk about this piece, this revaluation yeah. of value. You suggest that as a society we have fundamentally gotten value wrong. 
um, we place value in um, in our labor rather than placing what our uh, understanding that really what value what is most valuable is in fact time in which we do not labor um, time uh, at which we are to use Aristotle's old terms at leisure right um, and um, this is the this is this is why he thought that this is where the, in fact the whole idea of the liberal arts comes from right this is the the these are the sorts of uh, of things in life that one could take up if one was had the freedom to to choose um, sort of how one lived one's life. Um, but you lay you lay out you suggest that actually that ends up uh, that ends up meaning that we get um, we confuse the means of our lives with the ends of our lives, right. and that we're sort of caught up in economic ways of thinking about life that sort of keep us trapped in these ways. I wonder if you could just sort of um, lay, that, lay that out for us. I think it's a really sort of compelling way of thinking about some of, the, some of the traps that we all, I think, routinely find ourselves in. Right, right. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. So, so the first thing to say, and I, and I love your connection to, uh, to, to Aristotle there, uh, but one thing I want to clarify is that my distinction between my notion of free time doesn't have to be leisure time in the sense we tend to think about it, like vacation, time off, and so on. The distinction is really like free time is time devoted to activities that we can affirm as ends in themselves, you know? And, and that can be extremely demanding work, you know? I consider this hour free time, for example, even though I'm working hard, because I, 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 you know, I don't think it's a cost that I have to come here and talk to all of you and discuss these things. I mean, that is, that is an opportunity to, to exercise my freedom. You know, it's something that I affirm as an end in self, pursuing these conversations, thinking harder about these issues. So this is free time, even though I'm working. Uh, but, the, and that's what, you know, that is the positive measure of value we, have because it's only in the light of that that we can then think about when you have to do something that's a mere means to an end that's like a negative cost that you try to reduce or have a machine take care of or something like that uh, now what i'm trying to show is that and this is a large argument so i can only sketch it but under capitalism that even though uh, uh, there is uh, a sense of that notion of value just because like we pay for each other's time and thereby sort of recognize that you know having to do these things that you wouldn't do if you didn't have to is a cost we can't actually affirm that the positive measure of value and what we should be committed to expanding in our society is that like we should be able to devote as much as time as possible to activities that are meaningful in themselves which can include socially necessary labor and the important things to do that are meaningful uh, but that sort of well-being and flourishing, because that's another name for free time here, time for flourishing, time which we can affirm as a time of flourishing, that doesn't have any economic value in itself on the capital, because like only if we spend that time producing and consuming commodities can we have a growth of value in the economy. And I'm not against the economy or growth or value. I just think that like we're measuring the wrong thing. And I'm trying to show why and why like being able to address all of these questions we are facing now has to do with socially being able to take ownership of, of, of what's worth doing with our time. Well, so then I think yeah. one of the things that happens in a society where we're, where the economy keeps putting the means of life front and yeah. center, yeah. Uh, German sociologist Hartmut Rosa, I think writes yeah. really persuasively around, and really evocatively around some of these things. Right. Uh, what part of part of the result of of this context is that we don't even we, we we don't spend any time thinking about what the ends of our lives would be. Um. So so let me let me let me ask you what um. What what is what is the shape of flourishing life? Um. What what are what what should the ends of our our lives be? What sort of I think I think what we've heard from you so far is it's an activity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What sort yeah. of activity is this? Yeah. So uh, two things. I mean, so like one thing the book does in the second half is to show the sort of principles in life which we would have to be organized so that we can even take on that question as a society and individually, you know? So rather than me prescribing the sort of directly what the shape of flourishing life is, I'm trying to sort of spell out the meta-ethical conditions for us to be able to like not just talk about that, but enact those conceptions of flourishing, you know? And that already tells you something about the form of flourishing life is that like self-consciousness, dialogue, reflection, you know, is an integral part of not just the means to the end of 
reposing in the highest good, but actually will have to be intrinsic, even in our highest flourishing, the question of like, is this how we should go on flourishing? Uh, is this the best way of being responsive to one another? That question will always be alive in us, not because we haven't arrived, but because that's part of the good itself. This is another sort of point about the finitude and sociality and what I'm calling the secular that like, uh, it's not just as long as we haven't arrived, we still have to live with that question and engage in these conversations about what we value. That is itself an exercise of the good and we should affirm that. Yeah. Does that run its own sort of danger of, again, sort of, I think where, where Hartmut Rosa would yeah. be concerned was he would say yeah. that itself is yet another articulation though about shared means that we can all be invested in. And he, and he would suggest, and I think this would be a, mm. a fair description mm -hmm. of part of what you're doing in your book is to say, you and I might disagree about what the ends of, of life are, yeah. what, the, what the true shape of flourishing is. But the nice thing is we can agree perhaps on what you call what you call the meta ethical sort of conditions yeah. right under yeah. which we would each be free to pursue our own vision right. of the good but that yeah. can in its own way become this sort of means that becomes the focus of our ends or is your precisely is the way i heard at the end of your last argument is your argument that no 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 yeah. these sort of meta ethical means yeah. are more integrally tied to the yes. ends of human life than yes. Um, then we might be we can, someone like Rosa's concern that would uh, right. that would fall under Rosa's concern. Yeah, yeah, and that this is I love the way you put that, and there's so much to unpack in that. But that plays out on a lot of levels. So I think, for example, in an emancipated form of life, for example, coordinating our activities that wouldn't just be something I do as a means. That would itself be an ex exercise of freedom because it would express my commitment to these connections being maintained. You know, so there are a lot of things that we now think of as just mere means that could be part of what is an end in itself, and that that is a freer form of life where, like, what I do, I can see it in the light of what I value and what I think is important. Uh, so, so and yeah, but that's a big topic. But th there's something very um, lots of things that we think are just structurally just mere means to an end can be transformed in such a way that they become activities that are actually intrinsically meaningful and that's the expansion of our freedom yeah well um i haven't done nearly enough i don't know if i've done any like just reading from your book so let me let me let me get, let me uh tee you up here with with uh, a couple sentences that i found particularly striking yeah you say um this is towards the end of the book we cannot discover who we are through introspection, but only by emptying ourselves out in the sense of being wholeheartedly engaged, being at stake, being at risk in what we do and how we are recognized by others. The idea, and that's a capital I idea, I guess, because we're thinking with Hegel, uh, the idea of who we are is not an abstract ideal that is external to, the, to our form of life, it is the principle of intelligibility in light of which we can succeed or fail to be who we are striving to be. We spend a, a lot of time um, in the faith initiative work sort of making spaces for contemplation, for introspection, um, also for dialogue. And yeah. we hope all of those things move us to action. But you, again, you, you sort of tie all those things together in, in some ways. I want, again, I wonder if you could just fill, yes. fill that out a bit more for us and what it looks yes. like to actually pursue um, yes. this ideal. Yeah, well, and uh, first of all, I'm so glad you read from those pages, which for me are some of the most, that's part of some of the most important pages in the book. So I really appreciate that. Uh, and uh, this, and one thing that's very important in the book, the sort of primacy of practice that I began with, with the secular faith idea, that's again, this not supposed to jettison the idea of introspection but disclose the notion of in, in, introspection where like there's not an opposition between introspection and practice or introspection and emptying yourself out in the world but that like because when you're introspecting you, you you're taking on the question of who you are as a social being you know who you how you're meeting your obligations you know how you're relating to others you know so that like we want to see that like there's not this inner space and this outer space but that like even what we call introspection is a way of like owning up to uh, my status and my responsibility as a social being. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's also why like, I don't think there's an opposition between theory and practice in the same sense. So, so, so rightly understood, 
I think introspection is great. I spend a lot of time on it. But we shouldn't understand this as something that is in opposition or like uh, just categorically different than uh, other forms of practice. It's a specific species of, of practice that is important, but it wouldn't make any sense unless I understood myself in my innermost being as someone who is dependent on others and essentially social and essentially with everything I do, emptying myself out in the world, just like Jesus, <laughs> and you know, having to be accountable for my actions and so on. And that's where everything lives. That's where everything's at stake. Uh, yeah, in that sort of like meeting of the inner and the outer, the interior and the exterior. Martin, um, thank you so much for joining us. I, I have, uh, as, as always, every time we have one of these conversations, I have a million other things I want to ask about. I think I like, right like there, you just like, I think give a, uh, just threw a wrench in the works of how we typically think about education even, or. Right, oh yeah, I, that can be the next conversation. I yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. have to like sit in each other's classrooms. Um, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much uh, for thank joining you. us this afternoon. Um, and, uh, on the and, and I do look forward to having you on site when that is, is possible. Absolutely, thank yeah. you so much. Thanks again. And, um, and for all, all of you who joined us th today, thank you for, for joining us. I hope you'll join us in the future at um, more uh, Faith Initiative uh, uh, events. Um, our next uh, conversation around a book will be on um, uh, Willie Jennings' uh, new, new book, uh, After Whiteness, uh, which if there are questions about education, uh, that book will help us uh, go further in that direction. But again, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Martin. And thank you. Uh, we'll see you next time.